Live from the 607, it's the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour, where we're talking everything going on in the world of sports. Join in the conversation on social media with the hashtag ODPH, because here we go. Welcome to an all-new edition of the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. What is happening, everybody? Thank you so much for joining us this week. My name is Ken M. Joining me in studio, as always, you know him. He's the co-host. His name is Padawan J. Hello, hello, hello. Folks, we have a lot to talk about in the land of sports, so definitely we want to interact with you after the show. So make sure to swing on over to odphpodcast.com, join the conversation on the social media accounts, check out Parlay Points, new blogs dropping this week, the T Public Store. It's always a good time to swing on over there and go get some ODPH merch, the classifieds, the directory, all that, and so much more, odphpodcast.com. And remember, use the hashtag odphpod on social media. But kicking off this edition of the Sports Show, mm-hmm. let's talk some wrestling, shall yeah. we? And I know we're going to talk AEW, but I just got to say, uh, from Monday Night Raw last night, can we just talk about Bianca Belair's hair and whipping Becky Lynch in the abdomen? What the fuck? Have you seen this? I've seen her do that before in the ring. No, and- yeah, she'd show Becky Lynch and Bianca Belair were having a whole brouhaha scuffle in the ring last night uh, as we record on uh, on Monday. This was on Monday Night Raw. But then you, I'm trying to find it on social media. Yeah, there we go. I'm showing you the picture. Jesus. Yeah, so if you go to WWE's uh, Instagram, any of their social accounts, and you look for a photo from Becky, she's pulling up like to show off her abs, not in any like, hey, look at my fucking six-pack. Yeah. But no, she got whipped by Bianca Belair. You know, Becky was pulling the hair, and Bianca went to whip it like she does often with her hair. Yeah. She did that to Becky Lynch's abdomen. I'll show. I'll play you the video once we get done with the segment. But if you're listening at home, go find it again. It's on any of WWE social media accounts. Somebody in the audience recorded the damn thing. You can hear the hair whipping her like it's a bullwhip. Yeah, she did that to Sasha Banks. If memory serves me right. Oh yeah, my like, god. Yeah, it's a it's a weapon to use in the ring. Like it's wild when Bianca does it. But hello, yeah. uh, United Nations. I like to register a weapon of mass destruction. Yes. What the fuck? Yeah, when she does that, that like I I cringe because. Not that I think it's a bad thing to do, but that has to hurt like oh, nobody's business. That's, and you know what? I think she, I think she also got hit in like the bicep. That to me hurts worse than the uh, abdomen does. Yeah, but Bianca in the main event though from in WrestleMania, in my opinion, her and Becky. Yeah, I'm excited for. But we have to talk some AEW though because yeah, yeah. this week is AEW Revolution Week. Mm-hmm. So. All Elite Wrestling is rolling into their pay-per-view season with their first one on the 2022 docket, and that is AEW Revolution taking place in Orlando on Sunday, March 6th, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time on Fight. If you're in the international audience, Bleacher Report Live. If you're in the States or a traditional pay-per-view, or they're actually doing a couple movie theaters, which I think is kind of cool. But this week, they're going to be still adding to the show, which I thought was kind of interesting. Mm-hmm. That they're still not so, like locked in for the card, but okay, this is something that they've been known to do from time to time. And yeah, it, and most co- well, it happens with a lot of companies, right? But going into this coming Wednesday is a very big one too, because Tony Khan, the president of AEW, has been talking about a big announcement is going to go down. Yeah, I know there's a media scrum that we are going to be a part of. That he is going to be there. I don't know if he's going to let the cat out of the bag there or just do it right on Dynamite. But there's going to be a lot of news coming out from AEW, as typically what happens in their pay-per-view week. It's always a busy week. It's always one going on. But with the card standing right now, and I know that we were talking about this on 607 TWS, which is available in podcast form right now, so you definitely need to go check that out. There's a lot of moving parts with this card. Uh huh. And I know, Pad, you are not an AEW guy. We make this very, very clear. Nope. But... You do know who's involved with the card. I do. And I want to get your opinion on the matches, too. That This would be something like, if you are not an AEW fan, would you tune in for this? Now, take away the toxicity of the fan base as it can be. Sure. Just on paper, if you hear about this card, would you watch it or would you not? And that's where we're going to go with. So let us break down AEW Revolution, shall we? Sure. Uh, so the first match we're going to talk about is the singles matchup for the AEW TBS Championship. And this is with Jade Cargill uh, defending her belt uh, against Ty Conti. So Jade Cargill is going to be a future superstar. She's fantastic. 
but she's still very new and she's still growing and getting better each week. She's obviously been on an undefeated streak in being the TBS champion. That's a very big deal. This feud, though, was really thrown together last minute. Yeah. And Ty Conte has, I will say, has been putting in a lot of good work on wrestling. Okay. Um, since we saw her from NXT to AEW. Like, she has made some vast improvements. I will give her that. Social media, though, uh, the buildup they've been doing, though, ugh, yeah, not the best thing in my opinion. You hate to see it. You do, and it's just bad. It's it's nothing really worth talking about per se. But going into this match, like I said, I feel they threw this together. Okay. So I'm gonna say this is gonna be Jade all day. Like this will probably yeah. be. I don't want to say the the worst match of the card, but this is one that for me does not have a lot of substance to it, other than it's gonna be good in ring work. Yeah, and, and I'm listing this first just because I'm not saying this is going to be the first matchup we see on the card, but I'm reading off the Wikipedia page for the uh, event. This is the first match they've got listed. I see this being like, because the, they, they, do the, they do the buy-in show or some show. Yeah, right? that's, a, that's their uh, pre-show. Yeah, they, they might do it during the pre-show, or this might be like a, I don't want to say a piss break match, but like, a, hey, we just had an insane match between either two factions or two two guys or two girls, and we need kind of that breather in between insanity, so this is going to be the kind of like come down moment, all right, let's calm down before we burn you out with the next match. Yeah. You know, uh, not to say it's not going to be a good matchup, but, uh, you know, it's unfortunate for them that they don't get to fully go nuts with this, but you never know. They might. Yeah, I mean, this could be a sleeper match on the card. I yeah. just, without a good story behind it and – the one that has happened for this match is really not selling me on like, oh, I really need to yeah, see this. Yeah, yeah. You know, this might be a sleeper match per se, but I, I'm going in with very low expectations. Uh, next up is a six-man tornado tag team match uh, between AHFO, so that's Andrade, Andrade El Idolo, Matt Hardy, and Isaiah Cassidy uh, with Mark Quinn and Jose the Assistant, which is a great fucking name, let me just say, Yeah. Uh, versus Darby Allin, Sting, and Sammy Guevara. So the whole breakdown of the A H H F O A H F O yes yeah like I forget pronouncing because I just want to say the Afo. Hard, yeah it's, thank you I'm gonna just roll with that so Afo A- Afo this has been basically just giving Andrade something to do uh-huh. Matt Hardy has been doing his best in my opinion Vince McMahon impression by trying to run his own you know I mean he's got enough experience with the man I can understand yeah that. like he's trying to, he's trying to run his own business and be an agent to everybody. Uh, and just Andrade getting paired with him is just weird. And yeah. I, I think they're so slowly building the seeds for Andrade to do a hostile takeover and kick him out. Okay. And I'm okay with this because obviously we have heard reports Jeff Hardy will be there as yeah. soon as his 90 Cause, days up with WWE. Because what he initially said that he's going AEW, then he walked it back. But it's still, I think, from what I've heard and kind of the hints and innuendos they've been dropping on AEW programming, that it's pretty much a foregone conclusion. Oh, I would say so. I think Which, hey, that's more money they need to spend on a wrestler. Well, that we'll get into that a little later, too, because I have a feeling that we're going to see another debut on this show as well. But for this match, i got to say... It's going to be Sting, Darby, and Sammy. I think it's a waste of a match as well. Mm-hmm. Just because Sammy is your TNT champion, yeah, he should be defending the belt. Yeah, I, I don't like I don't like it when WWE does this with the Intercontinental title. I, right. I don't like this when AEW does it with the TNT title. Yeah, defend the belt. I mean, you could add Sting versus or uh, Sammy versus Darby. Sure, and it would have been fine. Or sure, or, or run back Sammy and, and Andrade. But to do this tornado trios match, I'm. I, I just feel that this is another filler match, and I'm not. Oh, it, yeah, it is. I'm not super excited about it, but but I think it's very very simple. It's going to be Sammy gets the win over uh, Isaiah Cassidy. Like Cassidy's going to get pinned. No, th- this is another filler match. This is another match. Like I'm looking at going, eh, you know, Sting. Don't get me wrong, he's a legend. He's one of the best to ever do it, if not the best. That's you know your own personal ranking, mm-hmm. you know. But at this stage, I just don't want to see him wrestle anymore yeah i'm with him he's in his you know early to mid 60s i think you know he's reaching that point where it's like i don't want to see you wrestle because i don't want to see something happen to you that is catastrophic not to your professional career but to your livelihood and just your ability to live every day Mm -hmm. you know because as we all know with professional wrestling all it takes is one bad incident to just change the whole outcome of the match and change what happens here and I don't want to see something happen with that where he is like something terrible happens. Yeah. If you want to have him there at ringside and interfere in some way, okay, 
I, I'm fine with that. You know, he's not if if he's not gonna as long as he's not doing any crazy jumps off the top rope onto the announcer's table across. You know, whatever. Like if you want to have him there, you want to interfere, hand Darby or or uh, or Sammy the his bat. Okay, fine with that. But like to see him wrestle at this point, and I would almost put Matt Hardy in the same instance. I mean, Matt Hardy and Jeff have both been on the record of just how much toll and tread there is on their oh, tires yeah, from over, from over the years. Like you can tell just how bad his body hurts him just going around place to place week to week and Andrade I'm sorry I've never cared for Andrade I've never cared for Andrade even in his WWE days you know I was like I was all right with him when he was in NXT I was never that big on him and when he got to main roster I was I was like oh whatever he's there you know so it, it's to me it's just another example of a guy who left WWE thinking they were the hottest shit since sliced bread went to the company that's supposed to be you know better for creatively for wrestlers doing what they want to do and hey you're in the same spot you were before congratulations you know, and in terms of Isaiah Cassidy, neutral on the guy, so I really couldn't care less about any of the, anything in this match. See, I feel bad for him because Private Party, when AEW first started, yeah. was supposed to be like the new tag team. Like, they were the ones they beat the Young Bucks on Dynamite. Like, they were the ones that had the biggest upside to them, and now they've just become lost in the shuffle, which I think is a shame. Right. But it is what it is. But this is also when you have a very bloated roster, too, which, I mean, we'll, we'll talk about... More so when we get to the face of the revolution match. I really want to kind of dive into that a little more. But for this one, though, it's going to be Team Sting all day. Uh, next up is a three-way tag team match for the AEW World Te- World Tag Team Championship. Uh, and this is between Jurassic Express in Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus, who are the defending champs with Christian Cage, uh, versus Red Dragon and Bobby Fish and Kyle O'Reilly and a team to be determined. Although, well, let's face it, if you pay attention to AEW, you probably got a good guess who it is. Yeah. Hint, they're EVPs. Yeah, this one is just kind of... Jurassic Express is there to hand the belts over to somebody. Transitional champs. Yeah, and unfortunately. But it is what it is. Everything now in the top of the echelon of AEW, in my opinion, is really kind of hovering around the elite. Mm-hmm. The Young Bucks, Adam Cole. Bye-bye. Red Dragon, Kenny Omega when he decides to return. And yeah. then whatever they're doing with Jay White, if he is sticking around... Um, walking through the forbidden right. door from New Japan and right. Impact. Right. So there's a lot that's kind of hovering around this, but I know that they've been teasing, like, what side will Adam Cole be on? Bye-bye. And this match will definitely have something to do with that. Mm-hmm. Uh, i say it would be a nice swerve if the Bucks weren't the other team going to be added this week, but they are doing a match of some sort on uh, Dynamite to solidify who's going to be the third team there. So right. all, all signs point to the Young Bucks. Right. So, with that being said, I think this will be a great match for in-ring work, but I also am fearing that the Young Bucks are going to ret- or win the belts. Yeah, I mean, who would I like to see be the unannounced team? FTR. I'd, I'd be all, I'd be all, I'd be all right with FTR, Santana, Ortiz. Hell, if you can even work out something where Gals and Anderson show up. Mm-hmm. You know, not necessarily have them win the belt, but hey, somebody other than the fucking Young Bucks, I'd be all right with that. Because, listen, I like the Young Bucks. They're, I've seen them in person a handful of times, you know, before they were in AEW. You know, they're great. They put on good work and fine work in the ring, but just they haven't really done anything for me that I've seen. You know, because while I don't watch AEW, I do see some of the highlights. I do see the clips and all that. They haven't done anything for me that's like, oh, my God, that's awesome. I haven't seen them done it that do that before. It's kind of like a wash, rinse, repeat method with them sure. the last, you know, however many years. So while I'd like to see literally anybody, it's probably going to end up being the Young Bucks, and it's probably going to set up something at their next pay per view with them against the formerly known as uh, formerly known as uh, the Undisputed Era. Yeah, the Red Dragon. Yeah, I, you know, like I'd say, I'm I'm hoping Red Dragon wins this because I think that'd be a nice swerve, and then you could kind of build that story if you want to do them in the Bucks. Hey, I mean, you'd, you'd be building out, you'd be building up somebody other than you know your elite crew. Well, that's what they're going to need to do if they really want to kind of prosper. But I think that. Unfortunately, with the Bucks still being hovering around that title picture, and like you touched about, teams like FTR, Santana Ortiz, have not gotten enough opportunities, in my opinion, for the belt since they've been there. It's a very fine line to walk if you're the Bucks, but that's what I think. They, if they, the smart money would be Red Dragon to win. I, I'm fearful it's going to be the Bucks, but it's going to be what it's going to be. But I think the match itself is going to be really good, though. Oh, I, yeah. I think with everybody involved, I think you're looking at a very solid match, and I think you're going to have somebody come in and do some interference. and that's Probably. How, that's how Team A is going to win, whoever that's going to be. Probably. 
Uh, next up is a singles matchup between Brian Danielson and John Moxley. Okay. This match should be very good. This match should main event. Let's, I mean, listen, I know there's a tie, there's a singles match for the world championship, you know, still to come. But let's be honest, this shit should main event. Well, they've done a great job with Brian Danielson in this heel role that he's been in. And now, recently, he's been trying to form his own dojo, I think. Or, okay. or something, a variation. like Stable he, type he, of stable, thing. Yeah. yeah. But it was something like he wants to be training the future of AEW. And I know he's mentioned Lee Moriarty and Daniel Garcia, which I think is great. I'd love to see them paired with him. And he's trying to recruit John Moxley to be his partner in all this, which right. is kind of an odd storyline in itself. But uh, I'm here for it, though, because with Moxley, since he's been back in AEW, um, really has to get you know a good storyline going. And with Dan- sure. Danielson, I think will be a solid one for him. I just don't like them paired together. I think it's going to be like Moxley. Uh, might win, mm-hmm. and then Danielson is still like, or Danielson is still like, okay, well, you know what? Hey, you won. We we did this. Join my team, and he doesn't. And then he's going to get either post match beat down, or he's going to get jumped before the match. Like yeah. like we discussed on six or seven TWS. Like my opinion about that still hasn't changed. Yeah, I think you're going to see the faction of Danielson form here. Yeah. And either they take Moxley out before or after the match, but still it's going to happen. Like, yeah. that's my prediction about that. But I agree with you. This, oh, is, yeah. this is one of the main events for me. I mean, this is a match that from start to right before the finish is going to be absolutely awesome. Potential for match of the year candidate. Mm-hmm. But I think what's ultimately going to end up happening is, like you know, some other instances with AEW, great start. Great build up, you know, re- if we're talking like, you know, what they teach in, in English class with story, you know, introduction, rising action, the climax, and then falling action. You know, great intro, great rising action, great climax, great falling action. That resolution's going to fucking suck. They're going to bo- they're going to botch the ending on this somehow. Yeah, that's the one thing I'm I'm fearful of. But I but I'm going to put the car- good karma out there. I'll say they won't they won't screw this one up. Sure. I'm, gonna, I'm optimistic. Uh, next up is another singles matchup between Chris Jericho with Jack Hager taking on Eddie Kingston with Santana and Ortiz. Bring, oh. you, bring your Timberlands, folks. I'm going to say this right now. If Eddie Kingston does not beat Chris Jericho, I don't know where you go with this. I don't know where you go with him. Eddie is the heart and soul of AEW. He's, he's won the fans over, if anybody was on the fence about it, after his valiant sacrifice saving Moxley from the barbed wire exploding oh, mind yeah. match, yeah. ironically, a year ago. Oh, that's that's true. Yeah, so he has won the fans over. He has been one of the biggest flag wavers of AEW. Oh, sure, which I get. Yeah, so, I mean, he waves the flag like nobody else. And I think that now is the time you start doing something with him. Like you've had time with a program with Miro, which I thought he should have won the TNT title from Miro. Thought mm-hmm. that would have been perfect timing. You've had him in feuds with CM Punk, which I I thought they could have done more with, but they sure. didn't. So now it's like with Jericho, what do you do here? And with Kingston, I mean, he's been talking on the mic. The, the promo work he's been doing has been great, which you know he's capable of. And now that he is kind of the catalyst for the uh, breakup of the inner circle, mm-hmm. I'm okay with this. Like, I think that now is the time you you make that move. I think Jericho is going to actually do the job, and I'm good with this. Probably. I know he's. I think the Jericho cruise is coming up. It's still like it's, it's about this, it's about that time of year. But at this stage, it's like, what does the influencer? And I hate that name too. I, I it's, it's nails on a chalkboard. For Should me. I cancel the shirt I bought for you? That's in the mail. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh. I like I just I don't get where he's going right now with it, but he does not need this win. This is all Kingston all day. Yeah. So uh, I'm going to say, uh, hopefully Kingston. Listen, Jericho don't need it. You know, hopefully it's Kingston. Uh, next up is a face of the Revolution ladder match for a future AEW TNT Championship match, uh, and in this matchup you have Keith Lee versus go, taking on Wardlow uh, with Sean Spears, uh, taking on also taking on Powerhouse Hobbs. Also in the matchup, you have Absolute Ricky Starks, uh, and then you've got also got Orange Cassidy uh, with Trent Beretta, and then a final member to be determined. Okay, so this one is very intriguing. Uh-huh. Uh huh. You have a lot of very big, powerful guys in this match: mm-hmm. Wardlow, Keith Lee, Powerhouse Hobbs. 
you don't have necessarily your standard high flyer that's going to be doing some crazy spots. Sure. There's one more spot still left to be filled. We have heard a lot of talk about, you know, Shane Strickland's been signed, so we could see him maybe possibly show up. Uh, you've heard about, obviously, Jeff Hardy, but, I mean, I don't think there's an early release for him to come in there as no, well. No, no, there's no way. But I think this goes back to your bloated roster problem that you have. You have so much talent right now that trying to put everybody in a match and give them time is really becoming difficult, and especially like in a situation with Keith Lee, who debuted a few weeks ago and had an amazing debut. I think it was one of the best matches that they've done in AEW. Now he's in this picture where he could get a title shot from this, which I I have no problem if Keith Lee was. Oh, yeah. Was no, absolutely. It. But then again, it's like I don't think it's going to be good for him if he's up show or upstaged. Oh, thank you. By a new debut. Sure. Because it's kind of like, wait, I just got here and now you're yeah, already yeah. pushing somebody else. Like, I think that that would just be weird booking on that end. Mm. So I'm not super excited if they do that. Like, I think what should happen is the final two people in this match, regardless, should be Wardlow and Keith Lee. I think that what they've been doing with Wardlow and they've been doing the Batista esque face turn with mm-hmm. him. That I think that this would be a great thing for him to get the the brass ring or whatever they're defining yeah, as. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then that's where you can kind of build a feud with MJF because if MJF is still going to be heel, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, then this is where Wardlow doesn't give him the, the opportunity. He takes the belt for himself, and then he gets screwed out of the title shot, and then you can go a lot of different directions with this. I would have no problem with either of those two winning. But I think, though, if you have a debut coming in there, yeah, I think that that would be very bad. Yeah. And I think that it would completely upstage Keith Lee, and I don't, oh, think, absolutely. That, and I don't think that's right. Like I think it's like you have all these signings, and we're just bringing in more people, more people, more yeah. people. Yeah. That you've only had Keith in one match. He's now here. Okay. So... Like, let's start pushing him. Let's start doing something with him. Yeah. And just to have it be replaced by whoever the TBD is, is going to be very interesting. Like, I just, I it depends on who it is. Like, I could almost see it be Jay White, too. Maybe, yeah. But. Or I could, I could see it be Jay White or somebody you haven't seen on uh, t- TV in a while. That makes more sense to me than bringing in somebody fresh and somebody new and somebody unsigned. But let's face it, that's probably what TK is going to end up doing because, hey, he's like a kid playing with the action figures and making up all his fantasy booking in his head, and it's actually playing out on TV. Yeah. You know, but I, I don't think he should do that because I, all the reasons you said it would hurt Keith Lee. It's Keith Lee's first, you know, pay per view matchup on AEW. You know, give him his time to show. Even if he doesn't win the, even, even if he yeah. doesn't win the match and doesn't get the future title shot. Give the man his time to shine. Don't bring the guy in and hype this shit up as, oh my God, we got Keith Lee here. You got the fans all hyped up that all oh, he, now he's finally going to get the justice he deserves and the shine he finally deserves, only to have it overshadowed by somebody else getting brought in to an already overbloated roster. It's just not something he or you need. No, exactly. So unless it's depending on whatever TK's announcement is. Right. Because we'll, we'll get into that at, at the end of the segment. The roster is just growing so big, and there's only mm-hmm. so many spots and so much time for everybody. Like yeah. this is where I think would really hurt if it's a new debut, and like literally, you just had Keith Lee debut in the company a couple weeks ago. Like, yeah. it's what are we old news? Like, stop, yeah. yeah, stop. This is where somebody needs to really pump the brakes here. But I'm going to take Wardlow in this for storyline purposes, and maybe they'll kind of build into something for, with him, Keith Lee. Yeah, uh, I'm going to say Keith Lee. Okay. Uh, next up is a singles match for the AEW Women's World Championship, and that is uh, between Dr. Britt Baker, DMD, who is defending her belt against Thunder Rosa. Hell fucking yes. This is long overdue. Uh, to quote LeBron James, it's about damn time. Seriously. Rosa should have been in this title match a long time ago. It also shouldn't have been this long for them to run it back. Uh-huh. Let, let's face it. Like, I realize you got plans and you book things out and... You set stuff up. But even I, who don't watch AEW, heard about how great that match was and how insane it was. If I'm a promoter and I'm the head booker, I put aside all other plans or put all other plans involved with those two women on pause for maybe a couple of weeks, and then I run it back. Absolutely. like this is, It's a travesty that we've waited this long because they had one of the match of the year candidates last year. So now we're finally getting this match. All signs point to Rosa and New. Okay. Like, I don't think you can have Britt Baker go over her. I just 
think that the momentum right now is in Rosa's favor. You've had Baker have the belt for a while. Yeah. It would add a new dynamic to that division. And quite frankly, Rosa's do. I mean, she's one of the best on the planet, period. And the body of work speaks for herself. Like what she's been doing. I know we're saying like, oh, we're talking about GCW. And right, right, right. But she's been killing it everywhere she's gone. And with Baker, this is now a real credible threat because obviously their match they had a year ago, last March, Mm-hmm. Now we're finally running it back. So, like, let's go. And I'm telling you right now, Rosa's is going to get that win. Feeling this one. Could be. Uh, I'm going to say Thunder Rosa, too. Okay. Uh, next up is uh, CM Punk taking on MJF in a dog collar match. Okay. Now, this one, Pat, I'm going to ask you, have you heard the MJF promo? Heard bits and pieces of it. Okay. So what has been going on here is CM Punk has been on the Happy to Be Here tour. Mm-hmm. We've discussed this many times here. It's like Ronda Rousey. Yeah. Smiling and uh, cheerful when you probably shouldn't be. Yeah, we've talked about it on 607 TWS. We've talked about this at great lengths. I think on Blogs Count Anywhere we've talked about this. He has had a very lackluster return. Yeah, I'd say I so. I, yeah, I'd say so. I mean, he's definitely been working with a lot of the, the newer talent, and that's great for being as for being gone as long as he was. I didn't exactly expect him to get you know a rocket strapped to him and like t- instant title shot and instant title reign and this that. But like, name me one fucking thing of note he's done since he showed up. Yeah. Right now, this program has been very good, though. I will say this is one of AEW's better storylines they've had. MJF has taken him on the mic. Sure. Every time. Oh, MJF is one of the best of his generation on the mic. Oh, absolutely. He's the future of the business right now. Like, uh, when he becomes a free agent in 2024, the bidding war for him is going to be outrageous. I don't care what form it happens in or how it happens. I just someday want to see him versus Miz in a promo off. Oh, my God. I, I I don't think we're ready. I, I don't think we I don't are. care how it happens, whether it's got to be some charity stream for, like, cancer research or, or whatever it is. Mm-hmm. You know, some magical stars align, and all of a sudden AEW and WWE do a joint pay-per-view. I just want to see them go up against each other on promos. I would love to see that, too, because MJF's work right now has been phenomenal. And last week he cut the best babyface promo I've heard in recent memory. But he's supposed to be a heel. No, that's the thing. And if they're smart, they keep him a face. And they flip Punk to be a heel. Oh, yeah. that's I, That, to me, is where Punk is at his best. Yeah, he needs to be there. The happy-go-lucky Punk is not working. No. So this match is going to be absolutely incredible. Mm-hmm. I, I, I feel that they have very good chemistry together. And I think that you're starting to slowly see those seeds being planted with Punk because I think that if you watch the reaction from the crowd, and this is the AEW crowd, when MJF is on the mic with him and they're going back and forth, you can kind of see Punk's frustration a little bit. Yeah. In my opinion. Yeah. That I think that the reaction he's getting, I think he's very surprised that the young superstar there is hanging with him. And I think this is kind of some, in a sense, motivation for him. Mm-hmm. That I think that if he wants to get back to being the best of the world, Punk. Sure. You got to buy in on that heel. No, oh, yeah. He- heel punk is better than face punk. You know, and, m- and maybe this is just in the last couple of days, a bunch of his promos against Rock when he was in WWE. He'd been coming up on my YouTube uh, recommendations. Mm-hmm. You know, but he had the one promo in WWE against Rock where it was before their Royal Rumble match. Yeah. You know, and, and they were talking, and Punk was like, I'm going to beat your ass. I don't care how many times you've done this, that. But like, also, you think of like Rock back then had this shirt that said boost to asses. Yeah. You know, or whatever. And Punk came out with his plain white t shirt that said, knees to faces yeah that was heel punk that shit even looking back on it i'm like that's fucking brilliant oh yeah that's amazing what has he done lately that even replicates that nothing well that's the whole point is he's now got to get somebody to light a fire under him and hopefully mjf this this program's doing it i like i think it's not exactly very obvious that it's doing it but I it's think motivating that, him but i don't know if necessarily the fire's been lit right but i think you're kind of seeing some sort of reaction to that. No, you are. That's, I'm interested to see what happens on Dynamite this week because if they decide to have Punk, or uh, MJF go back to be in a fa- or a heel, I think that hurts a little bit for this match, but it doesn't take anything away from it. I hope they do the smart decision and MJF still goes over. Yeah, but I fear that's going to be Punk. I just 
Ugh, I just I, I'm yeah. fearing this. Yeah. Uh, and then in the uh, what's probably going to end up being the main event is a singles match for the AEW World Championship with Hangman Adam Page defending his belt against Adam Cole Bebe. So this is thrown together too. Like Adam Cole cut a promo on Rampage a couple weeks ago. Sure. And ran his record. Ironically, this was after he lost the street fight to Orange Cassidy. Right. And said, I've never been defeated in AEW. No, we have to re- remind fans, though, the street fight was non-sanctioned. So that right. it basically never happened. And allegedly, Adam Cole might be cursed. Yes. So with that being said, he's now turned his sights to Adam Page. Now, Page has not had a great title run, in my opinion. I think he's only defended the belt uh, uh, under five times. Looking it up now. So, with that being said, I think they're going to put on a great match. They'll put, definitely put the work in. They'll definitely tell a story in the ring. But I am going to say uh, outright, this is Adam Cole's time to get the belt. That I think that Paige, unfortunately, the honeymoon is over. Yeah. And I think that they're going to move the belt off him, which I think is not the right call. Yeah. Because I think that if you really want to establish Paige as the future of your company, right, you need to have him go over those guys. Okay, so according to ProfiteDB.com, uh, Adam Page, of course, won the championship from Kenny Omega back at AEW Full Gear in November. Okay, uh, He's defended the belt the first time was on an episode of AEW Dynamite, the Winter is Coming episode on December 15th, where he fought to the time limit draw against Brian Danielson. Mm. Uh, the next time he defended the belt, so number two, was a couple weeks later on January 5th, again against Brian Danielson, where he pinned him. Uh, and now he's got this up, uh, upcoming match, and then he defended it a third time on February 9th uh, on an episode of Dynamite against Lance Archer in a Texas death match, uh, where he defeated Lance Archer. So he's defended the belt a grand total of three times. Yeah. That's why I'm saying I fear that three the, times in let's see November December January February in three times in three months yeah I, the honeymoon's over and I think that he's going to get the belt taken from I don't think it's right I don't think it's fair but it's supposed to be the greatest building building storytelling the greatest storyteller story in pro wrestling in the last thirty years yeah I think unfortunately, how's that working for you I think unfortunately that Paige is falling victim to being forgotten about because be. of because of all, everybody who's coming in. Hey, it sounds familiar. I mean, this, it's the sad thing about it, but with all this talent now coming into the company and your champion has not defended the belt more than three times, mm-hmm. like, this is a problem. And and as somebody who doesn't regularly watch AEW, but I do see stuff on Twitter, you know, there's a bunch of friends of ours who watch AEW and tweet about it regularly, sure. which, which is fine. Shout out to them. You know, and I also peruse the Squared Circle subreddit, which is very pro AEW. Mm-hmm. You know, let's you go there any damn day of the week and you'll see what I mean. You know, but more often than not, on Reddit, you know, obviously when the guy friends were fo- people were friends with on Twitter, they're talking about it in the moment. You know, that's fine. Sure. But in terms of the Reddit stuff, it's more often the spots and the stuffs. I can't tell you the last time I saw something Adam Page related that was of note. Out- outside of the Brian Danielson time limit draw, you know, that obviously caused some wins. And a lot of people were talking about that. But after that, I couldn't tell you fuck all what he's done. I obviously know, because, but I had to look it up. Well, that's a sad thing that, unfortunately, they really mishandled his title run, in my opinion. Like, I think that he needs, if you're really going to bank on him being the guy, he's got to go over Cole. Sure. You have to have him retain. And and whether you set up something for double or nothing and really build a long program, like, he's got to start defending that belt. Like, I don't know if you have to do open challenges and see who walks through the door, but you got to start doing some more things with him because I, I'm fearing that his title run feels transitional. Mm-hmm. And you're just waiting for Cole to take it so you can set up a feud with him and Kenny Omega. Yep. I'm going to call that out right now because I think that everything at the top of the storyline around the world title and tag belts has to be the elite versus the formerly known as Undisputed Era. Because, hey, when half of your upper echelon of producers, whether they are actual producers or just producers in name, uh, are all in a faction together, they're obviously going to make sure they're at the top of the card and they look really, really good. Case in point, WCW with the NWO. Don't Mm. believe me? Google Hulk Hogan's contract from back in WCW and read that shit. No, you're right. I mean, that's it's the crazy thing about this for where AEW is now going because obviously since its inception, we thought we were going to get something different. It's gone through different phases where we we. 
think it's going to be something else, and it's not. The in-ring work is fine. I never have an issue with the wrestling. I never do. I'm going to say that right now. I don't like a lot of the storyline builds, and I don't like how they make some decisions here and there. Sure. But that's me being a fan, but I'm still watching every week. So that being said, on paper, I think this card looks okay. I don't think it's anything really, like, blowing me away. Mm Mm-hmm. There's a few matches I really like. I'm, I'm Kingston Jericho. I'm actually really into. Sure, because I think Eddie Kingston needs to get that win. And CM Punk MJF. That's the one I really want to see. Sure. And me, I'm a huge Thunder Rosa fan, so I want to see her and Britt Baker again. I think that that's where I'm kind of leaning with this. Now, Pad, as we alluded to, you're not an AEW guy. Sure. Take everything out concerning the fan base, concerning yeah. that. We've just gone over this card. If you can watch this card, would you watch this? No. Why? Uh, on the nine matches listed, there's one that I would actually like to see and one that I would like to know the outcome of. The rest, I could not give two flying fucks about. And that's and that's not even regarding the fact I don't watch AEW. I don't care about Cargill versus Ty Conti. Mm-hmm. Sorry, I don't. I don't care about the tornado tag team matchup, which is just an excuse to get Sting on your television screens again. Sorry, don't care about anyone in that faction. Don't care care about the World Tag Team Championship matchup. Sorry, don't. I've seen Bobby Fish and Ky- and Kyle O'Reilly wrestle before. I saw him do it for two, three years in NXT. Sorry, don't care about it. And I don't really want to see the Young Bucks win another damn belt because hey, seen it before. Uh, Danielson and Moxley is about the only match I would like to see because I don't think in their time they were in WWE together, they ever had a singles match before. And if they did, it was on a random episode of like Raw or SmackDown. That I'm actually very interested in and I would like to see. I know they've done uh, a couple six-man tags with the Shield versus Team Hell No. Right, Right. tag matches with various folks, but never one-on-one. So this might, unless, they, and then and now I'm not also not counting some random house show in, yeah, yeah, sure, in sure, sure. Boise, Idaho, where they took on each other. But for television purposes, this might be the first time they've taken each other on in a singles matchup, you know, um, between WWE and AEW. So that I'm very much interested in and I would like to see. Jericho and Eddie Kingston, listen, unless Eddie Kingston and, and Santana and Ortiz come out wearing Tim's, I don't give a fuck. Well, you know they're going to. They have to. But the, that matchup, don't care. The face of the Revolution ladder match, don't care. Britt Baker. Now, Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa is the one that, like, I don't necessarily need to watch or see, but I'm interested in to see here the outcome and how it went and what people thought of it. Mm-hmm. You know, Punk, MJF, don't care. And then Hangman, Adam Page, and Adam Cole, I don't care. Yeah. You know, just so if you're going to make me, because it's what, like 50 bucks for an AEW mm-hmm. pay per view? You know, if I'm getting folks together, you know, minimum, minimum I'd like to get five people together, just make it 10 bucks a pop. I'm sorry, I can think of a lot better things to spend $10 on if I if I manage to get five people together and watch this than spending it on this on this card which you know if I'm if I'm spending $10 on something if I'm spending $10 on a meal like a Burger King or McDonald's which is pretty easy these days I want to get something I get something that I enjoy all of not oh I only like this but I don't like this this other stuff I know I buy something that I enjoy from start to finish mm-hmm. I'm not spending $10 if I'm splitting it with five friends on something I'm only going to potentially care one maybe two matches about no i mean that's an honest opinion for this i mean i think the match is definitely has some moments on this i mean the card does definitely have some moments on it and like i say i'm gonna be watching this with a with a group party like we always do we pat is witness to it i have just purchased this yeah yeah, i did yeah so i'm not gonna be somebody stealing it uh and i'm gonna definitely check the show out like i said i think it's a it's an okay card i think there's a couple matches that really stand out to me sure but I also want to see what they're going to do this week, too, because with two more shows going into this, and I have a feeling they're going to add one more match to this, and I think it's going to be uh, Malachi Black's faction versus uh, Penta and, and Pac. I think we're going to see maybe some rollout with more announcements, and maybe that might be a selling point for some people. And Pat, I know you're out, so I'm not I'm not yeah. saying you. Yeah. But it's all going to kind of center around, too, with what I'm going to close with here. We know Tony Khan has made a very big public statement that there is a major announcement coming this Wednesday. Because look at his track record on that stuff. So that being said, 
What do you think it's going to be? It's probably going to end up being a, a show of some sort, or some venue they've not been to before. I know uh, Japan is opening things up again for for folks to go over there, but you need like a worker's visa mm-hmm. to get in there. Like you don't have to quarantine for fourteen. I know Dave Meltzer was talking about it on uh, his thing. I saw a clip of um, that. Like you don't need to quarantine fourteen days, ten days, or or even three days. That like as long as you as you take a COVID test and you're negative before you fly over and then you test negative when you get over there. And it's so long as you have a worker's visa, you can get in there. So maybe if it's like, they're going to work a Japan show and they're going to do something with new Japan, which would be awesome to see and might actually get my interest involved, depending on who's involved. You know, I I think it would have to be something like that. I have a very unique feeling that they're going to be in some kind of business relationship with ring of honor. Okay. I haven't seen anything. We're pressed with both. I have not seen anything official. I've not, you know, had any kind of inklings to what exactly. I just have in my gut a feeling that it's going to be Ring of Honor related. Whether it's they have now possibly rolling out a streaming service and maybe they purchased the library. I mean, why would they need to roll out a streaming service? You've got HBO fucking Max. Well, I mean, they might want to do their own thing. Like, yeah. that's, but you ne- you never know. Like I said, that's the one thing with it too, because I know because that... I know I know HBO Max is looking to get into like live sports broadcasting. Well, maybe that's something they're going to start doing. I mean, that, it's like I say, it's very tricky to see how they're going to do something like that. But I think if they were try- going to try doing their own streaming service, maybe f- at first and then kind of go with HBO Max later, like you know, kind of like WWE Network did, and then went to Peacock. Mm-hmm. I think they're going to try doing something like that. Like, And I think if they get the Ring of Honor library, since there's a lot of their talent that has years of footage there, yeah, that could be a big selling point, especially they have, uh, they have the rights to All In, which was right. the first unofficial AEW pay-per-view. So, I mean, there's a lot of this circling around that, but that's my gut feeling, that it's going to be something business-related with, with Ring of Honor. Sure. Either way, they have a very big week lined up. And two more shows left to go into their pay-per-view weekend. ODPH Society, what do you think AEW is going to be doing this week? Are you excited about AEW Revolution this Sunday? Are you not? And what do you think the big talk is going to be from Tony Khan? What do you think we're going to have surprises thrown at us too with two shows before the pay-per-view? Let's talk about that, shall we? Hit us up on the hashtag, hashtag ODPHpod. Let's talk some AEW, shall we? And if you want some more pro wrestling talk, definitely make sure to check out 607TWS on your favorite podcast player. And definitely check out Blogs Count Anywhere on odphpodcast.com parlay points. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. So 2021 is upon us. And instead of flying cars and monkey robot butlers, we have a pandemic. We have media and making every little annoying twit of a child think they're going to be the next famous celebrity because they did some stupid trend they've seen somebody else doing nine million times we have people that are self-entitled and stupid and given a voice through social media constantly whining about how everybody else is the problem and how everyone else needs fixings we have celebrities lecturing us about how we have to give more so we can elevate everyone to a better life from the security of their seven bedroom multi-million dollar estates we have politicians lying to us that they're going to fix the situations we're in that they created in the first place and then we've got me having the conversations that a lot of us are thinking but nobody's talking about because these things have to be said i had to say at the podcast Available wherever you get your podcast fix or at www.ihadtosayapodcast.com. Why don't you come listen to what I've got to say? Coming back for another segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. And let's talk some UFC, shall we? Now, this past week, there was a fight night that definitely stood out with Bobby Green jumping in on 10 days notice to fight Islam Machayev. Mm -hmm. And this one went... Kind of like how I thought it was going to go. I was hoping Bobby maybe held on a little bit, but coming in on that short notice and fighting Islam, you're gonna it's, it's a long day. I mean, I was optimistic. I figured uh, Islam would win, you know, and, and I will say, you know, I tuned in for the main event, you know. Uh, it looked like green hat. It was pretty evenly matched for, what would you say, 30, 45 seconds? Yeah. And then Islam kind of just like figured out his timing, dialed it in, and then just imposed as well. Yeah, I mean, obviously, getting trained by Habib. Yeah. 
you know what you're going to expect from him. And if your ground game is not on point, you're going to be in trouble. So now it appears that finally Machev is going to get his title shot. Supposedly that's what Islam's camp was told, or at least that's what I saw in a post online. Correct. Yeah, the Dana said that yeah, he'll get the winner of Oliver and Gaethje. Which at this point you have to. Oh, yeah, there's no way you can deny it. Ten in a row? Yeah, ten in a row, and his one was like super early. His one loss is, was super early in his career. Yeah, because there was rumor. Obviously, he did such quick work that he was going to be fighting this week. Uh, I heard he was petitioning for it. Yeah, he was trying to, which, I mean, kudos to him. I always like it when fighters step up on short notice and try and save a card because, obviously, as we'll talk about with UFC 272 here, this card has kind of had some influx going on. Yeah. And obviously, with the, with the co-main is now completely flipped upside down. Let's break this whole card down and really see about what is going on this weekend from the T-Mobile in Vegas. Yeah, so uh, starting off, we're going to talk about a welterweight matchup, which is taking place in the main card, that between uh, Alex Oliveira and Kevin Holland. So this one, expect a lot of striking. This will be a lot of fireworks. Uh, Alex Oliveira definitely will be ready for this. He always puts on a good show. Kevin Holland, you know... Is going to be talking a lot in the cage. I expect this one to be very back and forth. I do like Kevin Holland, though, in this one. Sure. So I'm going to say he'll win by TKO stoppage. Uh, So looking at the records, you have Alex Oliveira, who in 36 professional matches has a record of 22 wins, 11 losses, one draw, two no contests. He's currently on a three-fight losing streak. He, uh, He lost his last fight to Nico Price by unanimous decision. That was back in October. Nico, who follows the show, shout out to Nico. Uh, Lost his matchup against Randy Brown uh, by a rear naked choke submission. That was back in April of last year. Uh, And then also lost by guillotine choke submission to Shavkat uh, Rachmanov. That was back in October of 2020. So we've got a little bit of work to do. Uh, On the flip side, you've got Kevin Holland, who in 29 professional matches has a record of 21 wins, 7 losses, 1 no contest. That 1 no contest coming in his last fight, which was against Kyle Dukakis. That was at a UFC fight night back in October, uh, where they accidentally bumped heads and Holland was knocked unconscious. Yeah, it was a freak grappling headbutt it's like a one in a million type of thing yeah that doesn't happen often yeah uh prior to that he lost his fight against marvin vittori and by unanimous decision that was back in april of last year and then he lost by unanimous decision to Derek brunson that was in march of last year uh before that he was on a one two three four five fight win streak yeah the one thing about holland that we got to remember too his ground wrestling game has to be improved i think that Oliveira is going to keep this on his feet though so i I think he'll get by in this one. Yeah. But I know that that was an area of concern for him, so hopefully he's addressed that for this fight because otherwise I think Oliveira's smart play would be take him to the ground and see what you can do there. But I think Holland has been working on that, so we'll kind of have to wait and see. Yeah, I'm just looking at the kind of breakdown of their matches. Neither one of these gentlemen uh, gifted submission specialists. You know, they've both got five wins uh, by submission under their belt. You know, so I, I think ultimately this one's going to be either a decision, whether it's unanimous split decision, or somebody's going to get knocked the fuck out. Uh, and I think in this instance, uh, no matter what the outcome is, when, uh, you know, whether it's knockout or decision, I think it's going to end up being uh, Holland. Yeah, I, I agree too. Uh, next up is a matchup in the featherweight division between Edson Barbosa and Bryce Mitchell. Yes, this one, very interesting fight. Striker versus grappler. Bryce Mitchell, we haven't seen in a while. The last thing we heard is he was off from a hand injury, which is crazy to think that he's been gone that long because he was on fire when he was in the cage. And obviously, taking on Edwin Barbosa, this is not going to be an easy task. No, uh, Bryce Mitchell in 14 professional matches has a record of 14 and 0. Uh, won his last fight by unanimous decision. That was in uh, October of 2020. Also, won his fight against in Charles uh, Charles Rosa in uh, May of 2020. Uh, on the flip side, you've got Edson Barbosa, who in 32 professional matches, 22 and 10 record, uh, won, lost his last fight uh, via TKO in August of 2021, uh, knocked out Shane Burgos in May of 2021, and then won his last uh, won the fight before that by unanimous decision. That was in October of 2020. Yeah, so this one definitely is going to be an interesting one to see. I do like Mitchell in this one though. I know he's been gone for a while, but I think when you've had Barbosa go up against grapplers, he's struggled a little bit. Because the one thing that Barbosa can do is he can strike from the edge. He can definitely give use a good reach advantage. Yeah. And especially for being in that smaller weight class because he used to fight in lightweight. I think that this is something that plays into his favor, but I never doubt Mitchell. Like, he has such a weird style to me. 
Like, it's just, I don't want to say like a lazy style, but he'll catch you when you least expect it. He takes a lot of damage, too. So this one, I do like Mitchell in that stoppage. I really do. I'd normally take Mitchell, but if it wasn't for the fact that he's had such a long layoff, and as I've said before, sparring and training and all that's fine. Sure. But, but it's nothing compared to actual in-octagon action. And just that that layoff, even for a hand injury, you know, basically a year and a half, that's a long layoff. And so the uh, threat of octagon rust do, does concern me. Oh, no, that's an absolute real concern, too. I mean, you don't know how a fighter's going to come back, especially with hand surgery, too. Are you really going to be feeling comfortable you know, doing yeah. anything like that? So right. it's something we're going to have to keep a watch on, but I I got this fe- weird feeling. Like, every time I think he's not going to pull it off, he does. It's kind of like the Robert Whitaker syndrome. Sure. Like, every time I think Robert Whitaker, even though I do like Robert Whitaker, I think it's like, nah, he's not going to win this one. Yeah, he finds a way to do it. So I think Mitchell's going to do the same thing here. Uh, next up is the co-main event of the evening, uh, which is a, a catchweight fight at 160 pounds uh, between uh, Rafael Dos Anjos and Renato Moincano. Yes. So this card, like we said, has kind of gone through a little craziness, obviously. Dos Anjos' first opponent had to pull out. There was talk that uh, Machev was going to step in, and obviously Machev did not take a lot of damage against Bobby Green, so he was yeah. ready to go. Yeah, so this fight was originally supposed to be between uh, Dos Anjos and uh, Rafael Fizev, I think is how you say it. Yeah. Uh, it was originally scheduled for a fight night uh, uh, on uh, the Walker versus Hill card, but it was postponed because uh, Fizev had visa issues. Mm-hmm. You know, And then uh, Fizev tested positive for COVID-19, and so now you've got Moincano taking the fight on four days' notice. Yes, this is absolutely wild. But kudos, God to damn. Mo- kudos to Mike Mo- Mo- you know, for doing this. Like I always appreciate the Donald Cerrone mentality of like anytime, any place, anywhere. You're in the fight business. This is what yeah. you do. So step up and do it. And if he gets the win, that's a big feather in the cap too. Dos Anjos is I, I don't want to say on the decline, but the better years have uh, I think. Caught and you're passing by a little bit. Currently 37 years old, turns 38 at the end of October. Yeah, I mean, hell of a career, though. Nothing, yeah. nothing to sneeze at. 43 matches under his professional record, 30 wins, 13 losses. Uh, he's got 5 by knockout, wins by knockout, 10 by submission, 15 by decision. Uh, he won his last fight against Paul Felder. That was a split decision uh, victory. That was back in November of 2020. Uh, lost against Michael Chiesa by unanimous decision. That was back in January of 2020. And then lost his fight against Leon Edwards by unanimous decision. That was back in July of 2019. Yeah. So this one, I like Moicano in this one. Yeah, Moicano in 21 professional matches has a record of 16 wins, 4 losses, 1 draw. Uh, is on a 2-fight win streak, beating uh, Alexander Hernandez via uh, rear naked choke submission. That was back in uh, February. Uh, actually, it was like 2 weeks ago. Uh, and then won his fight also by rear naked choke against uh, Jai Herbert. That was back in June of 2021. Uh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to say uh, Moincano, too, despite the fact that it's only on fucking four days' notice, which is insane. Yeah. Uh, bit of a youthful experience on him. He is only 32 years old. He turns uh, 33 here uh, next month. Uh, and then just Dos Anjos. He, listen, there's a lot of tread on that tires, and better years are behind you. Yeah, I mean, there's no shame in that. I mean, obviously, when you, you hit that age of, like, 35 – you start seeing like where fighters are kind of shaping up. He's taken a lot of damage this year, but he's always stepped up to fight whoever they've asked him to. So like it's not like he's had a cupcake schedule, if I can yeah. say that. Yeah. He's fought names. So there's no like disrespect going on with this. He's had a lot of tread on those tires. And I oh, think yeah. I just think at this stage in the game, what's there left to do when you start approaching forty, it's it's tough for fighters. Oh, like yeah. there's only a select few that can keep it going past 40 and i think in his case it's like might be time to start thinking uh doing something else maybe but we'll see what happens uh and then in the main event of the fight we're all here for is in the welterweight division between colby covington and jorge masvidal well the soap opera here where do we begin (laughs) it's a long laundry list yep i mean former teammates now turned bitter rivals you now have Colby Covington being the character of all characters. Oh, well, he was. I don't think he's that so much these days. I still, but in the in the interviews they've been doing, like they've been selling the fight, which I mean, that's what you want to do. Masvidal, I don't think uh, is going to be fighting for the belt anytime soon, but I don't no. think he needs to. Like he's a guy that you can get on a card, and you'll definitely get a reaction 
yeah. out, out of people. Like yeah. he, he's, he has that kind of Conor McGregor it factor. Certain fighters do that. You can put him on a card. You can face him anybody. And now you play him in. Now this one though is a little more personal. Like we said, they used to train together at ATT and Covington obviously uh, rubbed people the wrong way allegedly. And you know, he was, he's left the camp and, you know, there's a lot of personal photos between everybody there. So this one, there's a lot of bad blood going on there. And it's interesting to see how this is all going to kind of shape up when they get in the cage. Yeah. So, Pat, you got those records ready? Yeah, so Colby Covington in 19 professional matches has a record of 16 wins, 3 losses. Uh, lost his last fight uh, by unanimous decision to Kamaru Usman. That was back in November. Uh, knocked out Tyron Woodley with a rib injury. Mm-hmm. Uh, that was back in September of 2020 and then lost again to Kamaru Usman who knocked him out. That was back in December of 2019. Uh, prior to that, he was on a 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 fight win streak. Uh, On the flip side, you've got Jorge Masvidal, who's fought in even 50 matches under his professional record. 35 wins, 15 losses, uh, currently on a two-fight losing streak. But hey, listen, those losses are really nothing to lose sleep over. Both of them are to Kamaru Usman. Uh, The first one, the most recent one was Kamaru Usman knocked him out. Uh, That was in April of 2021. Uh, and then it was the second. Uh, then this other one was a unanimous decision loss. That was in July of 2020. Prior to that, he was on a three-fight win streak, knocking out Nate Diaz. Although that was doctor stoppage, uh, knocking out Ben Askren with a flying knee in the fastest knockout in UFC history in five seconds, mm-hmm. uh, and then not knocking out Darren Till. That was in uh, March of 2019. And this, like we said, is extremely personal. The former, yeah. former teammates, former best friends. Wasn't allegedly. there a scrum backstage at a UFC event between these two as well? Or am I thinking of somebody else? Uh, I know there was one with Masvidal and Leon Edwards. Yeah, maybe. So, with but with Covington, you never know. Because ever since he adopted that heel persona, he's definitely generated a certain buzz around him. Yeah. Love him or hate him, he does have that it factor too. That's why this is a big box office fight. Yeah. I just feel at this stage, though, that Masvidal is in this, and I think that this might be something they'll get him fired up to fight. Oh, absolutely. And I think that he is definitely going to be as ready for a fight as he's ever been. Yeah. I just think, though, at this stage for him, like you touched upon, 50 professional fights. 50 professional fights. You know, what else does he want to do? And obviously, after this, I don't see it running back with Kamaru Usman. Mm-hmm. I, I just that's not going to happen. So yeah. you have to kind of figure out, okay, what do you want to do to keep yourself motivated? To fight. <laughs> yeah, uh, fifty professional fights. His first one was on uh, his first professional. Now, mind you, again, this is professional. This isn't. Yeah, I, this isn't like semi pro or like under leagues or anything. So this could go back further. His first professional fight was on May. You remember where you were? May twenty fourth of two thousand and three. Oh wow! Uh, and he's also we should note has one. Uh, boxing match under his belt. So in total, he's fought 51 professional uh, striking events. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's absolutely crazy. But this is where you kind of have to say, like, after this fight, where do you go from here? I think he's going to lay it all in the ring for this one. Like, yeah. I'm, I'm not going to say he's done after this. I don't, and I don't want that getting twisted in any certain way. I just feel that you know when you can't fight for a belt anymore because you've, yeah. already, you've, you've had opportunity upon opportunity. Yeah. Can you make a run at the stage to get back to the belt? Is it that motivational for you? Or are you in this for big money fights? Which I think he is. And that and that's not a bad thing for them no. at this stage. Because if you're not fighting for a belt, you need to fight for big box office. Like, oh, yeah. And he is. So, like I say, I wouldn't doubt after this, maybe you do that fight with Nate Diaz. Maybe you, you do something with Connor. You could definitely try having something there. But I think for this one, with being so personal, and Covington, let's face it, has a gas tank like no other. The pacing, I think, is going to give Masvidal fits because he's definitely evolved as a fighter. Oh, absolutely. And I think unless Jorge Jorge can figure this out, I think it's going to be a long night for him. I'm rooting for Masvidal. Don't get it wrong. But I'm saying this. I think Covington's pace is going to be just too much for him. I think he's going to win by decision. And then where do you go with him from there? I don't know. Like, yeah. That's the thing with Covington. You fought Kamaru Usman before. Yep. I mean, you could try selling a trilogy fight, but I just I don't think that's going to happen at that stage. I no. Just, I just I don't. No. 
So it's kind of a very unique feel to this fight. Like I know that Colby has talked about doing wrestling, so maybe that's going to be something for him as well. Yeah, I mean, both of these guys, as I mentioned, have fought Kamaru Usman. They combined four times. They already combined 0-4. Yeah. So what do you do at that stage unless Usman leaves the division to go up? I mean, you you never know. Yeah. But for this fight, though... <sighs> I, th- I think they're both at a stage where I don't think either one of them are going to be getting belt opportunities anytime soon Mm -hmm. uh colby covington just turned 34 years old his birthday was a couple days ago yeah and then uh jorge masvidal is currently 37 years old he turns 38 in mid-november yeah so listen especially for her for jorge i think his unless he goes on some sort of like absolutely batshit bananas run and just starts knocking guys out like he's francis and ganu Mm -hmm. i don't think he'll get another title shot and i think for for colby he can make an argument for one, and he can make a case for one. But again, he needs to go on a bit of a run, and I mean by more than just decision wins. Yeah, that's going to be the problem with him. I don't know if that's going to happen at this stage. I really don't. No, I don't think so. But either. for this fight, though, I got to go with Colby. I'm not. I, I'm not. I'm not enjoying this either. No, I. I think were it anybody else, I'd give the opponent the advantage. But I think because it's against Colby. Jorge's a little more amped up for this, and he's trained. You know how, like, you you know you're going up against, like, if you're in the NBA, you're going up against LeBron James or, or Kobe Bryant when he was playing or Michael Jordan that, like, you had those guys that, like, trained in the gym a little extra longer, stayed up a little later to watch game film, you know, or whatever they did just because they're like, hey, listen, I know who I'm going up against. I need to beat this guy. I think that's where Jorge Masvidal is at for this. He's like, I need to beat this guy. This has got some extra meaning for me. I hope so. I hope you're right. I'm really hoping Masvidal does this. I, I can't stress this enough. I'm not a Colby fan by any means. Yeah. But we'll have to wait to see how it all shapes up on Saturday, shall we? Yeah. So let's talk about ODPH Society. Hit us up on that hashtag, hashtag ODPH Pod. UFC 272, what's your thoughts? Who you like, who you don't, and let's talk about it, shall we? We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. This is Tom from Tom Joe Lou. This is Matt from Sideroom Sounds. And you're listening to ODPH Podcast. Wanna go where no one knows my name To the desert, the oceans, or the plains Cause I wanna... Coming back for the final segment on this edition of the ODPH Podcast. Pad, what you got? I got to talk some local minute, and obviously that means some Binghamton Black Bears hockey news. Uh, looking at the standings, uh, getting closer to the playoffs because I'm noticing some X's and a dash next to some of the team's names in the standings. Uh, you've got uh, the Binghamton Black Bears currently in fourth place with a record of 22 wins, 17 losses, and then uh, one overtime uh, loss. Uh, and then you've got Columbus in third place, Danbury in second place, and Watertown in first place. Uh, obviously, to no surprise, Watertown has clinched a playoff spot yeah, they're, because they're fucking 30 and 8. Yikes. Yeah, ridiculous. Danbury and Columbus have also clinched uh, playoff spots. Uh, looking at the schedule from last week, good lord, that fucking score. Uh, the B- Binghamton Black Bears won their game on Friday, February 25th by the final score of 10 to 1. That's ridiculous. Uh huh. Uh, that was a home. That was a home game. So the folks at the uh, arena must have been rocking for that one. I don't think they've scored that many goals in a game in the arena ever. That's insane. It's been a long time, if not. Good lord. Uh, then they came back and won their next game against the Delaware Thunder. That was on the road. Uh, that was on Saturday. They won that by the final score of five to four. Uh, and then their game on Sunday against the Watertown Wolves. They lost in overtime by the final score of four to three. Looking ahead to their schedule they got this coming week, Friday, March 4th at 7.30 Eastern, they are on the road up and taking on the Watertown Wolves. Then Saturday, uh, March 5th at 7 o'clock Eastern, they return home to play the uh, aforementioned Watertown Wolves. And then Sunday, they complete, uh, I guess, the final trip of a three-game stand, three game stand uh, going back to Watertown to play the Watertown Wolves. Uh, more tickets, information, and all that good stuff, BinghamtonBlackBears.com. So, uh, yeah, and then uh, for my other base, i got to mention, as it was been widely reported today, I had hopes last night as we record because the Major League Baseball owners and the Players Association met for a ridiculous, like, 15, 16, 17. It was something absurd. Mm-hmm. It started at, like, 4, 4.30 in the afternoon and went well after midnight. Uh, you know, that they would be able to get a deal done because there was not a, a Major League Baseball and o- owners imposed 
deadline of I believe it was like 5 p.m. on Monday as we record. You know that if the a deal weren't met by then, then they'd have to start canceling games to start the season. The deal, the deadline got extended to Tuesday as we record. You know, so March got extended from February 28th to March 1st. You know, but as we sit here recording, uh, no deal was met, and so the first two regular season series have been canceled. Uh, because the Players Association has rejected the latest uh, proposal from Major League Baseball. Uh, reading from an article on ESPN.com, it reads, quote, uh, MLBPA player leaders agreed unanimously not to accept MLB's final proposal, and there was no deal on a new collective bargaining agreement before MLB's 5 p.m. Eastern deadline. MLB had threatened to cancel its March 31st opening day without a new deal, and Commissioner Rob Manfred confirmed that Tuesday afternoon. The calendar dictates that we're not going to be able to play the first two series of the regular season, and those games are officially canceled, Manfred said. The sides will head home after negotiating for nine days and determine next steps for returning to the bargaining table. Manfred said with the union representative representation leaving Florida, no agreement is possible until at least Thursday. The union is expected to address the media at 6.30 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Side note, we'll have anything on our Twitter account if anything happens with Mm -hmm. that. Uh, MLB's final proposal, which was delivered before 4 p.m. Thursday, featured an increase. And there's a whole, and I'll leave it there because there's a whole bunch of numbers and dollar amounts getting thrown on, the likes of which I haven't seen since the the Patrick Mahomes deal in the NFL. So essentially, it's a money issue in, in I should know this, none of this is on the players association. The players, it's not like the players association can't get their shit together. Can't agree on anything. Can't agree on what they want to do. No, the players are pretty unanimous on this and they've been unanimous on this since the outset. There's a money issue and it, and it's going back and forth on this. Uh, you did have a statement put out by the players association reading quote, Rob Manfred and MLB's owners have canceled the start of the season. Players and fans around the world who love baseball are disgusted, but sadly, not surprised. From the beginning of these negotiations, players' objectives have been consistent. To promote competition, provide fair compensation for young players, and to uphold the integrity of our market system. Against the backdrop of growing revenues and record profits, we are seeking nothing more than a fair agreement. What what Rob Manfred characterized as a defensive lockout is, in fact, the culmination of a decades-long attempt by owners to break our player fraternity. As in the past, this effort will fail. We are united and committed to negotiating a fair deal that will improve the sport for players, fans, and everyone who loves our game. Close quote. And I do want to stress, you know, some people say it's millionaires arguing with millionaires, and I would say under normal circumstances you would be right. But this isn't like the labor issues they had in the 80s where the owners wanted to do something and the players have said, no, no, no. This isn't like in the 90s where there was, a, you know, the owners wanted to institute a salary cap and the players went, no, 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 no. You know, there's literally like no one thing holding this up. It's just money. And f- there was somebody on Twitter uh, who asked, Explain the baseball lockout to me like I'm five, but give me more info than just money. Duh. And this is probably the response I saw is probably the most accurate response I ever saw and perfectly sums this up. So this is to explain the whole lockout in layman's terms and explain it like you're five. Uh, This person said, quote, you ask your mom for a piece of your own birthday cake. She gives you a smidgen of frosting and eats the entirety of the cake and tells you to be happy with the smidge of frosting she gave you. And, and the reason I say, you know, that is absolutely true was because a gentleman by the name of uh, Travis Sawchick, who writes for The Score, uh, tweeted out a couple of things. Uh, the first of which was the quote from Rob Manfred's press conference where he said, you know, the last five years have been difficult for the league from a revenue perspective, close quote. Uh, Travis Sawchick points out the MLB has totaled about $43 billion in those five years. Uh, He goes on to say, this included the COVID-shortened 2020 season, but every other year within the last five MLB seasons was at $9.5 billion or more in revenue. Team values are increasing. Only the Braves books are public, and they netted $103 million in cash flow in 2021. So this is entirely a owner-driven lockout. This didn't need to happen. They didn't need to do a lockout you know, this this isn't a labor stoppage. This is literally an owner-enforced lockout. You know, and you're getting some chime in from players. You had uh, CC Sabathia, 
uh, former pitcher for the Yankees and the, and the Bre- uh, Brewers and a whole bunch of others, to simply tweet out the face palm emoji. Uh, you had Marcus Stroman, uh, starting pitcher, said, quote, Manfred got to go, and I wholeheartedly agree with him. Uh, you had, let's see, I'm trying to find another one because I retweeted a whole bunch of them. Uh, you had, where is it? Uh, Clint Frazier, uh, former Yankee. I think he's with the San Francisco Giants now. Uh, I think it might be time to apply for that McDonald's job. Everybody said I'd be working, close quote. Hmm. Uh, and then you also had, uh, Trevor Plouffe, uh, uh, one of the more well-known baseball players quote, I saw the best proposal and it's an absolute joke. Laughable is another adjective I use to describe it. The whole negotiation has been a sham since MLB instituted the lockout. What an absolutely disgraceful showing by them. Uh, And you also had Anthony Rizzo, uh, who played for a long time with the Chicago Cubs, uh, currently with the New York Yankees. uh, Quote, to the fans, we will miss you most. To the younger generation of baseball players, this is for you. Close quote. So to Rob Manfred and the MLB owners, I say fuck you. Mm-hmm. This is entirely a money issue that you just see all the money you're getting. You want to hold on to it even more. You don't want to divvy it up as it should be and give players their fair share because, Hey, they're the ones laying their bodies on the line for this. And I realize it's not the NFL, but Hey, let's, let's, let's face it. They're sacrificing time, livelihood and their bodies, you know, down the road, especially you look at pitchers and, and the fact that you don't want to give them their fair share because you're piss poor negotiating tactics. I'm sorry. You locked them out and then didn't meet with them for fucking like four months. And you're sitting there going, oh, we negotiated in good faith. Fuck you. Oh, oh our fans are disappointed in this. We're doing this for our fans. Manfred came out and watched his press conference. Oh, we're doing this for our fans. The fuck you are? What the fuck are you doing that benefits the fans in any way of this other than making you look like pompous assholes? Fuck you. You know, baseball just can't get it right with the money. I like, I don't know why, like I agree with you. This is on the owners. And why is it that every so often we have to have an organization argue about revenue as much as baseball does? Yeah. And like, again, Manfred, the last five years were difficult from a revenue perspective. According to Forbes, uh, in 2019, the last season before the pandemic, Major League Baseball revenue jumped for a 17th straight year to $10.7 billion. Yeah. And that's according to Forbes. So you're telling me you don't want to divvy up some of that money as it should be and, and make it more fair? Pay some of the younger guys more for what it's worth? Come on. Yeah, like the younger guys I get. I'm not crying for about a Scherzer contract, though. No, the, and it's not really the big-name guys are like, oh, we need more money for us. No, it's like they're trying to increase money for the younger guys. They're trying to make some competitive changes. You look at the fucking fact that the Major League, and you can tell it's they want more fucking money because Andrew Marchand, who used to cover the Yankees for ESPN, but now he covers sports media for the New York Post, mm-hmm. tweeted out last night that, you know, it had gotten out that Major League Baseball brought to the negotiating table a proposal for expanding the playoffs from whatever it is now to a 14-team playoff. Jesus. Which last year would have meant, like, the 81 and 80 Phillies would have made it in the yeah, fucking playoffs. Like... But also the fact that ESPN had already bought up the rights to one of those early... It'd be like an early, se- or, or early playoff, like three-game series or something like that, to the tune of $100 million. You know, and ESPN had already gotten the rights to the one of those early series, whether it's AL, NL, who the fuck knows. Right. The players didn't necessarily like that. They came counter with a 12-team playoff. Now, the contrast with that is if it was a 12-team playoff instead of a 14-team playoff, the $100 million that deal is worth from ESPN all of a sudden drops to like 80 or $85 million, mm. which... You know the owners don't like that because, oh, we got to get the most money we get. We can get out of this. Oh. Fuck you. You're getting most of these new stadiums tax-free, and the, and the taxpayers are paying for this shit. Well, that's the problem that you have. But like I said, every so often when the money is coming in and everybody's happy, somebody has got to complain about it. And I, I sit here as a fan, and I'm just puzzled of how badly – the game has been corrupted by the business. Mm-hmm. Like that, like it, it, it's something I used to really love baseball yeah. growing up. Oh, I did. I do too. But I'm so like disenfranchised by everybody crying about money when you're making it. It just, it, it boggles my mind of like how 
they can't get it right. And every time we think we're here, somebody, whether it's the owners, whether it's the players, somebody's got to screw up the chain. Oh, yeah. And, you know, and obviously the communication's cut off. The chain is broken, so nobody's talking to anybody. The one the one instance I've heard with this, and I know Jeff Passan said it, I know I think Buster Olney has said it, it's not a case of, like, disagreements. With this. It's like the two sides are speaking different languages. Yeah, I mean, that's and, all. And you, you got one side speaking, you know, Japanese, and the other side is speaking, like, Swahili or something like that. That just, it makes no fucking sense. And you can tell Manfred is so fucking out of touch and doesn't know what the fuck to say. He was photographed as practicing his fucking golf swing before any of this shit went down, so you know he didn't give a flying fuck. And then you had a reporter during his press conference because he did actually astonishingly open up the floor for some questions. Mm -hmm. One reporter asked him why negotiations haven't been going ongoing for the last three months since the lockout started. His answer, and I quote, we've been here for the last 10 days. That's all I can say. No, I mean, that's what I say. The whole chain of command is broken, no matter how you want to break it down. And the communication lines are down. Like, it, it's just, it's so foolish to me. Oh, and yeah, and, and it's totally... Everything the last couple of days with all oh, there's progress, it's looking more and more like the owners are just trying to spin this shit so they look like heroes, and it's the players. Of walk- course, they're going to try doing that because they don't want to take the PR hit. Like you know, they're they didn't want they they didn't want to, but they're taking the PR hit because you had Manfred uh, say, "quote I had hoped against hope I ha- wouldn't have to have this press conference where I'm going to cancel some regular season games. I want to assure our fans that our failure to reach an agreement was not due to a lack of effort by either party." Close quote. You had Jay Jaff, who is a senior writer for Fangraphs, uh, used to write for Major League Baseball for Baseball Pro America and then uh, Sports Illustrated, mm-hmm. uh, say, quote, did he hope against hope that people wouldn't for- that what people would forget the league didn't make a single offer for the first 43 days of the lockout and made just one offer over the first 70 days? You cannot fucking tell me you made every effort to get this deal done and you made concessions when in the first month, two months plus, you made one offer, that's not a negotiation. No, it's not. And this is why baseball is taking that big L right now. And this is just, like I say, when you break the chain of command and you everybody's fighting about whatever. And that's, that's what it feels like to me. Like, the owners are sitting there and they're mad that... They're they're mad that the players want a decent cut of the pie. Yeah, and that's why I say like, and then the players are now breaking off with them. It's just when you have this breakdown, and that's the easiest way you can pry it. When you have this kind of breakdown, you, nobody's winning, everybody's losing. And if baseball hasn't realized they're not the number one sport in North America, oh, anymore. I think that I think they realize it. I think they have to that they're not the pastime. It's I, th- it's, I think they it's simply the NFL. I, I think they simply look at the dollar amounts that the NFL brings in every year, which it's like triple digit billions or some shit like that. Yeah. And then what they bring in, I think they know fully well. And I, I think the owners don't give a fuck. As long as they're getting their money, they don't give a fuck. And, and to the players, I say, stay united. Don't fucking crack under these assholes. And to the owners and Rob Manfred, I say, fuck you. Yeah. Here, here, Pad. I, I can't argue with that statement at all. Uh, I'll keep my base very short and simple because we got asked about this. Allegedly, Aaron Rodgers is asking about $50 million. Did you hear about this? Yikes. No, but I'm not surprised. Yeah, this was some kind of crazy notion that got thrown out there. They allegedly, and allegedly. I want to stress allegedly. Allegedly, allegedly. Allegedly. He's looking for a $50 million per year paycheck. Hey. And I'm like, a uh, couple thoughts popped in my head. One, I don't think Green Bay is going to pay that. No. No way, shape, or form. No. That would be a cap hit upon cap hits that I just don't think they have. But on the other hand, hey, listen, Tom Brady got that kind of money from Tampa Bay. That's true. And you can't say Aaron Rodgers is not worth it. But with all the nonsense going on with that, with him and the GM in Green Bay, where, like if, if that's his demand, do you cave and give it to him? And like, how do you dismantle your team? Because you have so many people that are free agents that are, you're going to need to resign. I don't know, Pat. Like, what's your feeling? I mean, it's absolutely insane to think that he wants. I mean, I understand him get you know back to back MVPs, one of the best players of all time. Can't beat the fucking Forty ers for all it's worth, but mm-hmm. but hey, you know it, it's a whole interesting thing. And I understand him going for fifty million, but I'm not sure the Packers will be able to swing it, just because I'm looking at uh, the Packers cap totals on Spotrack.com. 
Uh, the adjusted salary cap, is, according to Spotrack.com, is just a little over $211 million. Uh, they've got uh, $231.8 million in active contracts, $8.2 million in dead cap. They've got, uh, from 2021 rollover, they've got $2.8 million in, uh, in money. So total, they've got, uh, over all those, they've got $240 million that they've got committed. Uh, and then estimated cap space, all minus $28 million. So obviously they're over the cap, but they'll figure that all out because, hey, that's what they pay people for. I'm not sure how they'll be able to fucking swing this. And even more interestingly... Uh, apparently the Green Bay Packers general manager, Brian, and I'm going to butcher his last name, so I'll just spell it out. G U T E K U N S T, uh, has has said he's not getting any trade offers from any other GMs on Aaron Rodgers. So the potential for him getting traded someplace is at this point, like nil. Yeah. Gutenkunst, I believe is the name. Okay. But yeah, no, I agree with you. And I I don't buy that statement one bit. I think that they're not going to say anything to give Rodgers leverage. You, no. you, we've we've talked about this at at length that the GM and Rogers are not on the same page. Somebody's got to go. I think they're just trying to do the best PR job possible because as soon as the business is open for everybody to start talking free agency, yeah, I think you're going to hear some movement coming out of, out of Lambo. Maybe I, I know we got a lot of Packers fans too. I'm not trying to upset you. I, we know a lot of them are not exactly happy with Aaron, so understandably, if they're so. going to hit the reset, this might be the time to do it. But like, where do you send them with that much cap space? Yeah, I've, oof. like I, I don't know. Like, this is going to be a very puzzling thing to watch. But the fact that he wanted to get 50, like, listen, I can't argue that because Brady no. said Brady set precedent, so you can't be mad about that. Like if any Packers fans is like, well, wait, he's asking too much. No, he got it from Tampa Bay. Like. The only ones with that, and this is uh, according to SpellTrack.com, uh, the only ones with that amount of cap space currently available are the Miami Dolphins, who have $61.2 million in cap space, the LA Chargers, who have $57.5 million in cap space, the Jacksonville Jaguars, who have $56 million in cap space, and then Cincinnati's right under that with $48.7 million in cap space. Oh, that's Tony Khan's announcement. <laughs> we have back-to-back number one overall draft picks. We drafted Trevor Lawrence, but we're going to sign Aaron Rodgers. That would be some Tony Khan shit. Oh my god, I can't wait that for Rampage. Would, that would be some Tony Khan shit. I, I can't wait for Dynamite. Rather, oh my god, that's going to be the case. I don't know. I'm going to put this out to the ODPH Society. I want to hear your takes on this. Is Aaron Rodgers worth 50 million Packers fans? If not, who's going to give him that money in a trade? Or somebody try doing it in Madden and see if Madden will even let you do it. Yeah, I definitely want to talk about that. Because I, that, I mean, like I say, I can't argue it, but I wouldn't. No. I, but I can't necessarily say I'd pay that if I was a GM. But you know, at this stage in the game, somebody, somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to do it. Somebody's going to do it. Tony Khan calling that shot right now. That being said, Pat, the music you heard on this edition of the ODPH is that of Brian Wolf. Now Brian might try doing that. We know he's a Packers fan. <laughs> There'd be a lot of Spotify plays and uh start a GoFundMe. Yeah, I mean it could happen, but if I want to find out about Brian, where do I go? ODPHpodcast.com. Right on. Swing on over music section. Check out everything going on with Brian. Everything going on with Shout Out the Robot, Second Suitor, Tom Shalou, Yard Party, Floodlands, the list goes on and on. All fantastic people. But while you're at the website too, check out Parlay Points. New blogs dropping this week. Don't want to say we got uh, something coming, but we do. A word has it, Dre Driven has some things coming this week. Oh, yeah. So I'm waiting to hear about that, Dre. I know Dre's listening right now, so we'll see if he sends it over. Uh, also, at the website, check out the Classifieds, which has Friends of the Show, Organizational Link Support, and Black Lives Matter, all the amazing pod groups we're in, and of course, links to Friends of the Show, such as Eight One Two Two Productions, going on their four year anniversary coming up. Pat, nice four years of three fat nerds. So you know they got something lined up. Yep. And if you're listening to our Patreon, you probably have an idea what it is. Also, while you're at the website, check out the directory. We're Pat. How many providers are we on now? Uh, nine thousand five hundred and six. Correct. So if we're not on your favorite podcast player, let us know, and we'll try making that happen for you. All of that, the T Public Store, so much more. ODPHpodcast.com. That's all I got for this week. So for the one and only Pat One J, fuck Rob Manfred. I'm your host Ken M, and fuck the Astros too. We gotta keep tradition here. Yes, we do. Thank you for listening to the ODPH Podcast, better known as the Ocho Duro Parlay Hour. We'll see you next time. Gotta beat down to the punch. Gotta beat down to the punch. Cause they can't bring me down if I'm already under the ground. I'm gonna try to make them laugh. I'm gonna try to make them laugh. So life and man's got nothing to say.
way back 